So, hi. Uh, my name is Andrew Woods, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I uh, am uh, privileged to be a member of the, the DuraSpace team. Uh, one of the folks uh, actually developing the DuraCloud uh, product. Actually, before we jump into uh, the session, I would like to go ahead and uh, uh, support the, the ongoing effort of trying to disambiguate the uh, organization, DuraSpace, with the product DuraCloud. So uh, something you know, in the past, you know, on the order of a year or so ago, uh, the, uh, the gaze of two organizations met across a crowded room, uh, DSpace on the one side, and a fedora on the other. And, and one thing led to another. Uh, what ended up was sometime this past summer, July or so, uh, the two organizations uh, joined, realizing that they really had so much in common. Uh, and that joined organization uh, became DuraSpace. And so DuraSpace is a not-for-profit organization that uh, supports uh, open technologies around uh, uh, the, you know, the, the accessibility of durable content and working in collaboration with uh, other organizations and institutions that share the same values, namely the academic and the scientific and cultural heritage institutions, as well as the uh, technology uh, community. So uh, with that, actually I'm, I'm tempted to jump right into the presentation. But before doing so, I will take the moment to uh, go ahead and recognize the, the team of people and the efforts that they put into uh, making DuraCloud a reality. So to begin with, uh, there's a small group that we affectionately term uh, the triad. So uh, there's uh, Sandy Payette, who is over here. Hi, Sandy. And uh, Michelle Kimpton, uh, Brad McLean, as well as uh, we have uh, Chris Wilper and Carissa Smith, as well as uh, uh, Dan Davis and Danny Bernstein on the drums, or UI rather. And uh, particularly, I'd like to recognize uh, Bill Brandon, who is not here today, but certainly uh, deserves so much of the credit for making DuraCloud what it is. We've been working on DuraCloud for uh, something on the order of a year now. And what I'd like to do today is go ahead and give an overview of, of what we've been doing, uh, talk a little bit about what DuraCloud is, uh, discuss our pilot partner program that's been underway since this past fall, some of the things that have come out of that, as well as uh, go ahead and take a slightly deeper dive into the architecture, take a look at uh, a demo of a, of a running instance of DuraCloud, and then uh, make an attempt at peering into the future. Uh, at an organizational level, so DuraSpace I'm talking about, uh, we've put considerable energy into defining the, the mission uh, that, uh, we, that we believe in and that sort of drives a lot of the decisions that we make as an organization. We're into and interested in promoting uh, durable persistent access to digital data uh, and, and creating this, uh, these open technologies uh, in collaboration with the communities that, that share those same values. All right, so now a little bit about uh, DuraCloud itself. Uh, I'll start with saying that it is actually, it's a service, or it will be a service, that you can go to, say, DuraCloud.org, you can uh, input your criteria for what your storage needs are, um, maybe what your geographic concerns are, needs around where you want your content to reside, uh, you know, what, what sort of resource requirements you have, and then you can click on Go. An instance will be started on your behalf in the cloud. Uh, that is uh, uh, hosted or supported by uh, DuraSpace. So that, that's one thing. It's, it's actually a service that's provided by the, the not-for-profit not organization DuraSpace. And a couple of things that this service does is, one, it, uh, it sort of abstracts away the storage of underlying storage providers. So more specifically, uh, on the commercial side, we work with uh, Amazon. In, in terms of storage, Amazon S3. We work with uh, Rackspace Cloud Files, and we work with EMC Atmos. 
on the commercial side and as non-commercial providers, institutions come up uh, you know, the framework certainly allows, and you'll see that when we jump into the architecture, uh, plugging those right in. Uh, additionally, it, in, in addition to being a service, it is actually a open source uh, cloud-based application. So you can run it as, as a service or you can, you can download it to your local institution and uh, go ahead and play around with it, stand it up, and, and run it as your own internal service. And the the, the pluggable service framework that it provides really leaves the door wide open for any number of uh, service implementations. All right. So if you, if you leave this session with nothing else, uh, I would hope that at, at the very least you, you pull away these key points, uh, namely that DuraCloud offers mediated cloud storage. So it helps mitigate issues around uh, having, you know, on several different levels, issues around having to understand how to uh, communicate and integrate with any given cloud provider. And it, it, it mitigates the possibility of uh, that cloud provider making a business decision that's not in line with your business decision. So it, uh, DuraCloud facilitates uh, your content flowing across various providers, so it mediates that. And it also offers uh, sort of ready-to-use, out-of-the-box services that you can execute on your content that resides in the cloud. And, and obviously, from a user perspective, at the very least, the intention is for it to be easy. Uh, just graphically, trying to reinforce that same concept, you know, the idea of, you can't really see it at the top, but mediated storage. Uh, so any, any, any sort of uh, digital file, it doesn't, the format doesn't matter, you know, audio, video, whatever, you can push into DuraCloud and DuraCloud abstracts away the idiosyncrasies of having to uh, interact with the various underlying providers and it, it abstracts away the details of, of the various APIs that they offer. So uh, the, the, the lower portion of the diagram basically indicates that you can, you can push all the content to any or you know, any one or more of uh, the providers and you could potentially stand up rules that dictate you know, certain, certain types of content go one place or another. And then also in terms of uh, reinforcing the other key notion of uh, cloud-based services here, what we're just talking about is you, know, you have the ability through DuraCloud to r run processing on the content that is hosted in your DuraCloud account. All right, great. So now I'd like to change gears a little bit and talk about some of the experiences that, uh, and, and sort of what the whole uh, Pilot Partner program has been about thus far. So sometime back in the fall, we uh, went ahead and started to establish relationships with uh, these three organizations, uh, the Biodiversity Heritage Library in New York, Public Library, and uh, WGBH in Boston. Uh, in order to create you know, sort of a symbiotic, uh, mutually beneficial relationship around DuraCloud. So uh, you know, uh, on the one side, we were offering our, the, the DuraCloud service to these three pilot partners so that you know, in order to address real business needs that, that they individually had. Um, and then on their side, they were offering concrete use cases that helped uh, drive the processes and refine uh, the, the processes and, and services that we were developing and giving concrete feedback around that. And it's been absolutely wonderful. I'll go ahead and, and drive into a little bit of the use cases that they brought to the table. Uh, this is just sort of a, an aggregation of, of uh, you know, all, all three of the pilot partners' use cases, or at least some of the top-level ones. Namely, they were, they were really all interested in, as you might expect in regards to DuraCloud, they're all interested in having an online off-site backup of their content. So uh, DuraCloud certainly uh, offered that. There was also, from the NYPL's perspective, an interest in uh, converting their, uh, what turned out to be their 
uh, sort of a subset of their corpus of uh, TIFF images. And, and actually for all three of the pilots, up front we defined a data set that was on the order of 10 terabytes for, for each provider. And so with NYPL, we started off with 10 terabytes of their TIFF images, and they wanted to convert those to uh, JPEG 2000s. So we uh, developed services around that, and you'll see shortly there were some lessons learned there. Naturally, once those images were converted to JPEG 2000, then uh, they wanted to be able to see them. So we stood up the uh, J2K server, or uh, sort of spelled Jatoka, uh, J JPEG 2000 image server, and with a viewer on top of it, and we'll, we'll see that shortly. Uh, additionally, uh, the Biodiversity Heritage Library had the use case of, or an interest in internationally replicating their corpus. So what we're, what we're working on with them is we've already pushed, as it turns out, somewhere over 13 terabytes of uh, the BHL content into DuraCloud, and then we're working with uh, either in, uh, we, we're not sure where it's going to land, if it's in the UK or if it's in Australia, but uh, working through the, the details of then just pulling that content down from the cloud and uh, you know, any issues that may come out of that. Uh, additionally, on the WGBH side, as you may expect, they're interested in streaming the video that uh, they are uh, responsible for. And so straight out of the box, uh, sort of as low-hanging fruit, we have decided to uh, just just leverage what Amazon provides in, in their CloudFront service. They, they have a video streamer, so you know, we can easily uh, stream the content that's hosted in S3 that way, but we're also in discussions with the open source uh, video toolkit of Kaltura and have uh, made some early steps in the integration of that. Uh, additionally, just sort of at a, at a high level, there's this notion of uh, uh, processing over the corpus of, of uh, the content that, that is uh, held in DuraCloud. And more specifically, uh, BHL has a particular use case around extracting uh, the scientific names out of uh, their, their, their books that they have, that they have hosted. And, and the tool is called Taxon Finder, which you may or may not uh, be aware of. But the idea is that uh, we, we iterate over the content, their holdings, and, and are able to extract the scientific names using this Taxon Finder tool. And then the tool itself you know, creates the links and their relationships. But from DuraCloud's perspective, enabling sort of the, the mass processing over uh, the entire content set that uh, is held in, in one's account. And then also uh, just this notion, uh, this came out of uh, the New York Public Library where they get a hard drive uh, on the doorstep you know, late at night or something and uh, you know, want to uh, triage it, you know, sort of uh, you know, do an initial look at you know, what is this, what should we do with it? And so uh, pushing it into maybe like a quarantine area in the cloud, having somebody analyze it, do some bulk tagging of you know, what what these files might be so that another department can uh, pull it down or do whatever needs to be done with it. So out of those use cases, uh, we had some good times, we had some bad times, but uh, certainly there was uh, a handful of lessons learned that came out of it, and a lot of them, as you may expect, came out of the, the ingest process. So you know, we're talking about three different organizations that, uh, at least for this uh, pilot round, had uh, upwards of, or in some cases exceeding, uh, 10 terabytes of data. And so, uh, so, so we, 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 uh, we learned quite a bit from that. One thing that uh, came up immediately was the fact that as we were, we were loading content, so let me, I can speak specifically for the, the BHL case. Uh, their content was previously, or still is actually, uh, hosted in Internet Archive. And so we were pulling the content from Internet Archive into their DuraCloud account. And in the process of doing that, realized we, during the validation phase of that ingest effort, realized that you know, there were some errors. And some of the errors were around the fact that some files didn't make it in. So it's like, hmm. And then the, the, some, sometimes the initial MD5 associated with a file didn't match the MD5 that uh, landed in DuraCloud. 
So in the case where files didn't, uh, didn't show up at all, actually what was going on in BHL wasn't aware of the fact apparently from, from the beginning that uh, files that exceed a certain uh, cap limit on size uh, don't get accepted into the underlying storage provider. So in, in the case of uh, Rackspace and Amazon, that cap is five gigabytes. Uh, so all the files that exceeded that size, uh, yeah, you, you, you just at this point you can't push it in. So the, that's where this uh, chunking and stitching comes from. So we, we had to solve the issue of being able to take these uh, large files and as they're, as they're coming into the system, go ahead and break them into chunks, capture, obviously we want to capture the MD5 of the chunk, and then also as the stream is going through, capture the MD5 of the entire file and, and uh, go ahead and package all of that information in uh, an XML document and, and push the chunks separately into DuraCloud. And then on the flip side, we want to be able to stitch those chunks together, you know, pull those constituent parts back into the parent file. So working through a lot of the details there uh, was good fun. And so, so we have uh, sort of two use cases around ingesting content into DuraCloud. One was sort of uh, over the wire, like I was mentioning there with the BHL. And we also, uh, WGBH brought to the table uh, the, the use case of not having the bandwidth to, to push the content into the cloud uh, in any sort of reasonable time frame. So they, they uh, worked with us in developing processes around shipping that content via hard drives. And so obviously, you know, some of, the, some of our concerns were having a manifest of what the MD5s of each of the content items was locally on the, on the system, and then on the hard drive, and then when it, once it lands into the cloud, you know, with the MD5s there. So having the accountability and the verification from hop to hop that, you know, ultimately the file that ends up in the cloud is the same file that uh, initially resided on uh, the, you know, the local system. And, oh, so one thing I'll mention, actually with the parallel upload, it also applies to the bulk image conversion. Uh, one thing that uh, we found, and it's uh, no big surprise, but we found in the, this effort in general is that one way to uh, address time concerns, be it uh, bulk image conversion or you know, the time it takes to push content into the cloud is to go ahead and break up the job and, and parallelize it over multiple cloud servers. And I have a, a graphic here shortly that shows that we were able to, in the, in the case of BHL, push this 13 terabytes of content into the cloud. Uh, it would have taken you know, a month or more but by standing up, I think what we ended up with was six servers and just having uh, three different processes on each server, going, you know, pulling from Internet Archive and pushing up. And, and with, with that configuration, we're able to, you see here, like in uh, a, a five-day time frame, uh, push the entire content up. And you see the, the green line marks. I imagine this is, this is fairly... Uh, unintelligible, but the green line marks the 10 terabytes, and uh, in each of the hash marks at the bottom are indications of a day. So this was just sort of an into, or internal uh, graph that we are using to track that progress. Uh, additionally, a, a, a big thing, actually, talking about lessons learned, is the, the bottom point about uh, the asynchronous nature of cloud storage. So naturally, uh, Duras, Duraspace, the organization hosting uh, or supporting uh, Fedora, the repository, as well as DSpace, it, it only makes sense to go ahead and, and plug DuraCloud in underneath those repositories. And so uh, currently, uh, Fedora, you may be aware of, has a, a low-level storage implementation called a Kubra that the default implementation, it it writes blobs to the local file system. Now, uh, Chris Wilper, bless his heart, he went ahead and pulled together another implementation of Akubra using the same Akubra interfaces, but instead of writing to the local file system, writes to DuraCloud. Uh, and, and it works like a charm. Uh, well, except, uh, except it, it, takes a, it takes a lot longer than you might expect. Um, 
because of this. You, when you write to a file system, you write a file and then you get a return and you know it's there and, and you're happy you can move along. And when you're dealing with cloud content, it, you write a file and it takes a certain amount of time, usually on the order of seconds or tens of seconds, for the other load balance servers within the, uh, that underlying storage provider to sort of register the fact that a new, audit, new object has been created or has been updated. And so what Akubra does is in order to maintain the contract of, you know, when, you, when Fedora writes a, an object, it, it's guaranteed to be there, it sort of spins until it gets that confirmation that, okay, the file's there and then it returns and, and moves on. But uh, the overhead involved is um, noticeable. So you, I, I, I'm quite sure that in many use cases, uh, you know, that's probably accept, acceptable, you know, depending on how you're using your repository. But it also drove us to come up with uh, an alternative solution for integrating repositories in the cloud. And that, that solution uh, revolves around a, a client-side utility that basically does a synchronization with your local file system and your DuraCloud account. So you can point this utility at a directory or any number of directories on your local system, tell it which, uh, which space in DuraCloud you're interested in synchronizing with and any sort of new files or changes to files or deleted files get uh, synchronized with DuraCloud. So you can run your repository just like you normally would and then in the background it's being it, it sort of out of the, you know, the, the mainstream of you know, uh, requests and response. In the background it's synchronizing that with uh, your DuraCloud account. And so obviously, I mean, it, it works in the case of repositories, but it, it's really a general utility that, uh, you know, that anyone can use and, and something that, that we're doing just internally within the DuraSpace organization is each of us standing up our own uh, instance of this, this client-side utility and synchronizing uh, you know, whatever files we want to, just uh, you know, sort of working through any kinks that, that might show up in, in uh, you know, the, the initial release of this synchroniza synchronization utility. So, sort of a handful of things that have come out of the pilot effort. Now I'd like to go ahead and talk a little bit about DuraCloud itself. Uh, try to pick up the pace. So talk a little about DuraCloud itself. Like I said, it's a service that uh, you, can, you can go and sign up for. And once you input your criteria and actually sign up, you click on the button and it launches uh, an instance in the cloud for you based on you know, whatever, uh, you know, whatever criteria you specified. And then from that point on, most of your interaction with the system takes place through that instance that was launched on your behalf. So it's, it's actually a set of uh, web applications that you can interact with. And we'll go ahead and uh, pop the hood on that and uh, look inside of uh, some of the moving parts of DuraCloud. So what, I, what I'd like to do actually is sort of uh, a component view of the DuraCloud architecture. I'll, I'll sort of talk, talk to this at a, at a high level, just giving you an idea of what the, what the various uh, boxes represent. And then I'd like to flip over to a demo. We can sort of walk through a, a running instance of DuraCloud and just to sort of provide, you know, have, have some initial upfront context, look at the application, and then we can come back to this and, and maybe some of the smaller boxes will make more sense. So uh, one thing I'll say before we jump over to the demo is that what I would consider the two main components of the system are the, the two boxes in the middle, uh, the pink one and the greenish one, uh, Dura Service and Dura Store. So, as you might expect, Dura Service is the component that manages the deployment, installation, uh, configuration of all your services, and Dura Store is what is responsible for mediating the requests for uh, interacting with content, and mediating that down to the, uh, the underlying providers there at the bottom. And one thing worth, no worth noting is the fact that both of those components have a RESTful API sitting on top of them which basically opens up all kinds of doors for 
uh, other types of integrations. What, at, at the top, we have we have our own uh, implementation of a, of a web-based interface that interacts with DuraStore and DuraService, but it, that interaction takes place through the REST APIs. Um, it would be easy to go ahead and throw away the, the Dura admin, the, the UI that we've put together, and strictly interact with your Dura Cloud account you know, via uh, command line scripts, you know, using just wget and curl or whatever, or you could you know, build your own uh, uh, applications at your, at your institution that interact with the REST APIs, or you could you know, throw a Drupal on top of this that uh, under the covers plugs into REST, you know, these REST calls. Uh, as it stands right now, we, we've pulled together, just to facilitate that interaction, we've pulled together a web-based UI uh, called Dura Admin. We'll take a look at that, but uh, in, in, in looking at it, I would like to, uh, I would like to uh, just note that yeah, I mean, this is this is UI that we pulled together, but kind of like I said, it's it's not it's not required. This is not your only way of interacting with the system. We just we did it in order to to simplify things at the beginning. So let me just go ahead and uh, poke around in here a little bit. Uh, this would be the home page where you first your your uh, you know, first experience with your institution's Dura Cloud instance. Um, yeah, you can imagine uh, any any sort of uh, customization that could take place here in terms of icons and color schemes and that sort of thing, or you know messages about you know what content's been most recently uh, viewed or or used in some way or another. I will note that there are um, a couple different tabs here at the top. One that relates to your content, called Spaces, and one that relates to your services. We'll jump into those momentarily. And then also on the right-hand side here, uh, we, we happen to show the underlying storage providers that are connected to this actual instance of DuraCloud. So in this case, we have uh, Amazon S3 as well as Rackspace. So jumping into your spaces, so I guess it's worth saying that a space in uh, the Dura Cloud context is is really just sort of an abstract notion of a container for uh, for digital objects. And right now we have one space called CNI Content. Uh, you can have uh, up to a hundred spaces as it stands right now, just as a sort of hard cap. But in terms of content that you can put inside of each space, it's it's uh, it's unlimited, depending on you know, how you know, how, how much. Uh, storage you, you want to provision. So you can, you see that there's some metadata associated with the space. You can add content to it. You can remove the space. Uh, you can add a new space. Uh, you know, I mean, there's some special characters that you, you don't want to use, but otherwise you can name the space whatever you want to. For example, something. Um, Maybe um, and then there's this notion of access, open or closed, and and it's really as simple as that. If a space is open, then that means that all of the content that resides within that space, the URLs the restful URLs that can access that content are publicly available. If it's closed, then they're not. You have to actually provide credentials in order to uh, view that content. All right, so before we, well, I'll, I will actually mention here on the left-hand side, if you can see it, uh, there is the, the notion that you can associate uh, metadata with a space. So any, any, sort, of, any sort of metadata that uh, yeah, would be appropriate. So uh, uh, yeah, you know, whatever, whatever you want to. Just sort of name value pairs that you can associate with a space. Likewise, you can, you can add tags to a space, which uh, would potentially facilitate or just 
whatever you use tags for. Uh, All right, so we'll, we'll come back to the spaces in a moment, but I'd like to jump over to services. So actually, in terms of available services, we have right now uh, three that uh, are, are plugged into this instance, namely a replication service, which enables the ability to replicate content that say comes into your Amazon replicated over to Rackspace. You know, simple as that. Uh, also there is the JPEG 2000 service which stands up a, a JPEG 2000 server as well as a viewer for, uh, for serving and viewing images that are, uh, that exist in your Dirt Cloud account and, and then likewise there is this image conversion service which can convert from any number of image formats to uh, any number of other image formats. And under the covers, the image service is just using uh, image magic. So let me go ahead and uh, kick off, say for example, the JPEG 2000 service. And there's a little bit of a workflow here. It's uh, fairly simple at this point. You can specify uh, which server you want to deploy it on, but since there's only a single server here, it makes a decision um, somewhat trivial. And then this basically is just saying, okay, let's make it happen. And you may notice that uh, it takes a little bit of time. And the reason for that is the, the framework, the way it's set up, is actually the services are bundled as OSGI bundles. And for, for those that are sort of, you know, into OSGI, the, these are sort of separate jar files that can be deployed into an OSGI container. And what's happening is the service, actually, these, these jar files reside within DuraStore. So we have a, a service repository that hosts you know, a variety of services, and when you when you want to deploy one, you click on deploy. It pulls the services from the repository, streams them over to whichever instance you want to deploy. In this case, the primary instance, and then it uh, it deploys them into an OSGI container resident on that instance. As it so happens, the JPEG 2000 service takes a, a little bit longer than that even because once it installs everything on the OSGI container, it, it goes and it starts up a new application server, in this case Tomcat, and then it deploys the JPEG 2000 service into that new instance of Tomcat. Um, and then you know, once that's all happened, then it returns back and says you're good to go. Uh, I will also just go ahead and kick off the replication service, and then we can go back to the content. Serve sort of same decision process, quite easy. Uh, with the replication service in this particular release, and I, I guess I should mention that uh, we've had a couple different internal releases of DuraCloud. This one is the 0 0.2, so it's, it's quite young, uh, embryotic really. Uh, so we're going to have the 0 0.3 uh, towards the end of the month, and we have a, a sort of a series of other internal releases that are, are mapped out in their associated functionality. But here, the replication service, you can specify which, uh, which store you want to be the source and which one you want to be the sync. In this case, we'll say, okay, everything that comes into Amazon, go ahead and push that to Rackspace, please. And this one, this one takes a little bit less time just because it doesn't have the, the application server that has to come up and that sort of thing. But you see, you see a, a, a listing of the services that are installed. There, there are two here that I didn't mention, the Image Magic service and the Web App, app Utility service. These, these really, from a user perspective, they, they don't matter all that much. They're sort of uh, infrastructure required by the other services, as you may expect, uh, the JPEG 2000 and the, the image conversion service. But there are some properties that are associated with 
a service, and you can you can look at those properties by clicking on View here. But I mean, it's just a, it's just a REST call, so you can get that information by doing it command line as well. Uh, and and really, one of the one of the reasons that drove us to uh, choosing OSGI as our uh, framework for hosting services was the ability to, at runtime, reconfigure a service without having to sort of stop and restart any applications. So OSGI uh, provides sort of a very dynamic interaction. Go ahead and cancel out this. All right. So let's go back over here to spaces. Uh, and maybe just add some content. Uh, you, you can go ahead and pull any sort of file from your local system. It would be, I was hoping that we would find a pleasant image, but uh, maybe we'll just sort of uh, grab something. Hopefully it's non-offensive. You can, you can specify the, the content ID. If you, if you don't specify anything here, then it just takes the file name. Uh, under the cloud images or, excuse me, Sandy? Sandy? Oh, just this one. I'm not sure what, so I'll just leave uh, the extension off here. If, you, if, you, if it has the extension, then obviously it tries to uh, extract or, or determine the MIME type based on that. I'll just actually leave it. Uh, let it do its own thing in terms of the content ID and uh, figuring out uh, the MIME type there, which, which it did. And so a, you know, a thumbnail or you know, a fist nail or whatever actually is uh, created uh, from that image. And I imagine this one, yeah, it's actually quite small. Um, so you, if you click on it, it launches the the JPEG 2000 uh, server and viewer, uh, as, it, as it so happens, since it's such a small image, you, you don't really have the benefits of uh, uh, JPEG 2000, which you know, deals with tiling and different resolutions, but it's, uh, this particular example is uh, sort of uh, less dazzling. But a couple things that you might be interested in here are the, the checksum. Uh, so we, we, we retain the checksum of the file, which is later used by a you know, bit integrity check service. And then obviously the MIME type and the file size. And just like at the space level, you can also associate metadata and tags with, uh, with uh, you know, digital objects. All right, so let's go ahead and, and We'll just take a look at the rack space side, and you see that now that there, there's the top left hand or top right hand corner, you see we're we're looking at content that's stored within rack space, and you notice that there's this uh, space that was created because we turned on the replication service. So I created the space over on the Amazon side. Uh, that space was replicated over on the rack space side, and likewise the image that we pushed into Amazon also got replicated over here on uh, Rackspace. So I will go ahead and move along. Uh, additionally, we could, yeah, time permitting, we could go ahead and, and do an image conversion and change the, the PNG to you know, JPEG or whatever, but we'll leave that for now. And we'll talk a little bit uh, in more detail about the architecture. So on the storage side, 
we have a, a REST API that uh, we like to think is uh, sort of logical naming convention, I'll, I'll show you in a second here, of you know, sort of space and then content ID for interacting, you know, creating, updating, deleting objects, leveraging the HTTP verbs, so like put and push and delete and head and get. But so those calls are translated in the storage mediation layer, translated into an internal interface we call it the storage provider interface. So those, those calls get turned into uh, calls into this interface. And basically, in order to plug in additional storage providers, in this case, you know, we have Amazon and EMC and Rackspace, in order to plug in additional storage providers, all that needs to be done is another adapter has to be created that is able to translate between the API of that storage provider and the storage provider interface. And then you can just plug it right in and it, it and work right along with the rest of the system. On the services side, we similarly have uh, the REST API, which gets translated into calls into the service manager. And kind of like I mentioned, the service manager is the one that's responsible for the listing of available services and services that are deployed. It, it is able to interact, and actually, obviously, the arrow should be pointing the arrow going off to the storage should be pointing up at the REST API, but it interacts with DuraStore uh, through the REST API in order to pull the services over to itself or to the instance that uh, is going to be hosting the service. And then those services are deployed into the OSGI container on the, the appropriate server. And in a similar way that the storage providers all implement a storage provider a common storage provider interface, all the services implement a common compute service interface. So that allows the installation, the sort of statusing, and the update of, of services in a generic way. I, I will mention in terms of services, uh, right here we have uh, sort of three different flavors of services. Uh, we have just sort of pure Java. So that, that would apply to the replication service, where it's just, it's just Java code that deploys within OSGI, and it knows how to interact with uh, DuraStore. And it can say, OK, uh, content, it, it, here's a message that uh, a piece of content has landed in whatever is configured to listen to, in this case, Amazon. It knows how to talk to DuraStore and say, OK, go ahead and make a copy in, uh, in Rackspace. So that, that's just pure Java code. It runs in and the OSGI container and does everything it needs to do. It's self-contained in that way. Another example of a slightly different type of service is the Image Magic service. And basically, it's a sort of thin wrapper that has a representative here in the OSGI container in order to implement the basic functionality of deploying, undeploying, and reconfiguring. But ultimately, the service itself is running as a, a local system utility, like Image Magic, it gets uh, installed on, on the system in a sort of command line fashion uh, under the covers of this. This just sort of manages and facilitates that interaction. So we have the ability to handle uh, sort of system level services, as well as sort of these pure Java services. And then additionally, kind of what I talked about a little bit before, the JPEG 2000 service is an, actually its own standalone external web application. So uh, web apps that, you, that provide some sort of web-based service we're also able to handle within this framework. So this, I'll just sort of, you know, gloss through here briefly, it's uh, examples of sort of the syntax around our REST APIs. And uh, this is just a, a handful of examples uh, for getting content, or getting basically a listing of contents within your space, getting uh, any particular content item, and deploying a service. So your, your primary instance has a static IP associated with it. So obviously, you can, you can map any sort of domain name to that, and then for you know, the example of getting the listing of contents in your space, there's the, the context of DuraStore and then the name of the space ID. And actually, in our example, I, this, instead of images there, maybe it would be April 2010. And, and just doing a get on that URL would provide, in XML format, a listing of the contents in, within that space. Uh, in terms of getting an actual content item, the, the second example, the you know, same context with DuraStore, the, 
instead of images, it would be sort of April 2010, and then instead of the Rome JPEG, it would be uh, the, the one that we used, you know, whatever the logo was. So th this is here just to sort of demonstrate the simplicity of actually interacting with the, the underlying or the, the storage and services that DuraCloud, the API that DuraCloud provides. So that's your, that's your primary instance. There are times, and I've talked a little bit about times where it's interesting to uh, actually break up a job and run it over uh, in, a, in a sort of uh, parallel uh, processing scenario, run it over multiple instances. So you can also spin up multiple managed instances that the little purple box is there to indicate you know, that it has its own OSGI container which hosts these uh, deployable services. So you can break up a job and distribute it over managed services. Likewise, at the bottom, there is this notion of a pre-configured service. So that would be actually uh, like a virtual machine image that you have uh, at your, or, or that, that you've created at your local institution and you know, implementing a few basic APIs in terms of management, something akin to the compute service interface, we can deploy and undeploy and uh, do some reconfiguration of you know, we're required to launch a, a brand new instance of uh, a cloud server. But actually what's happening inside of that instance is completely up to whatever you've baked into uh, that machine image. So it's uh, sometimes of interest of you know, how, how security is handled. So I'll, I'll just uh, talk a little bit to that point have a couple different layers in DuraCloud. Uh, at the very bottom layer, each of the underlying storage providers has a notion of uh, security. And what, what we do in DuraCloud is go ahead and lock it down from the storage provider perspective uh, completely, or lock it down to the point that you have to be uh, the owner of the content in order to interact with it, to do any sort of updates or, or additions. You have to be the owner of it. And then on top of that, we have the DuraCloud application, and we have ap the application level security, which provides the, uh, you know, the ability to log in or pass in credentials, which then give you the authorization to interact with the underlying content. And on top of the application security, we have channel security, basically just the encryption of the appropriate calls so that your passwords aren't being uh, pulled as it goes across the wire, and that's just having Apache sitting on top of uh, Tomcat that you know, your DuraCloud and you know, DuraStore and, and uh, DuraService uh, web applications run on. And then on top of that, your whole instance is firewalled off so that only the, the common HTTP port 80 is actually open at all. All right, so moving along on the home stretch here, we have uh, a sort of look at the horizon. And some of the things coming up are, like I mentioned before, a, a series of internal releases, sort of dot releases that will push through the summer and into the fall. Uh, included there, I mean, I mean, there are lots of things obviously included there, but just pulling out uh, a couple of the highlights, sort of the integrations with the repositories uh, through this sync, sync utility. and. Obviously, we were, we're expanding the scope of the provided uh, support for underlying storage providers as well as compute providers. Right now, storage, we have the three, Amazon, EMC, and Rackspace. Compute, we have Amazon. Rackspace just came out with uh, the ability to have custom machine images that you can persist, which didn't exist before. So they just came out with it like two weeks ago. So that opens up the door for you know, being able to use them in a compute capacity in the way that uh, makes sense to DuraCloud. And we're in uh, continual, actual at this point, uh, weekly conversations with EMC, working through the issues of uh, you know, having their compute service uh, work in a way that uh, works for us and works for them. So uh, expanding that support and then uh, certainly uh, beefing up and expanding the service selection. And here's just you know, some of the examples of services that are on the horizon. Uh, you'll, you know, when you're talking about terabytes of data or more, obviously you want to be able to find that. So uh, we'll 
have uh, some sort of indexing and surge capability on that, as well as uh, more robust bit integrity uh, services so that you can, I mean, and we have sort of several tiers of that. Uh, you can provide, a, say, a manifest or a listing of your dig digital objects and the MD5s associated with it, push it into DuraCloud and say, okay, does it, does it match up and, and does it match, match up across your storage providers um, at a sort of higher level of uh, trust or uh, sort of assurance is the ability to regenerate uh, MD5s and, and potentially you can provide, the, the user could provide a nonce or a salt and have uh, the content you know, reread, regenerate the MD5 with the salt and then see if that matches what the, the user or the owner of the system was expecting. So you know, sort of beefing up the, the bit integrity assurance and sort of putting more functionality around replication so you can replicate based on different rules, MIME type or space or whatever, as opposed to simply everything that comes into Amazon, I want to push to Rackspace. Uh, and then, like I mentioned before, the video streaming and auditing services. And so we're actually open sourcing uh, the baseline for uh, OR10, so early this summer. And we're bringing in another set of pilot partners. Uh, in the fall, a subset of that uh, group will be working with earlier and sort of in a similar way that we've been working with the existing pilot partners, BHL, NYPL, and WGBH, but sort of more in a development capacity, particularly since the code will be open source. We'll be sort of working uh, with each other and having more eyes on the source code. And, and uh, so uh, the, the subset that we pull over will be helping with uh, actually expanding the baseline itself. And then the first public release, at least a beta version of it, will be coming at the first of the year. And uh, with that, I'll say that if you'd like to find any more information, there are the, the websites, uh, duraspace.org and duracloud.org. And uh, thank you for your time. <laughs>